welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the installation of the Oliver Lee McCabe III, PhD, professor in the Neuropsychopharmacology of Consciousness. Uh, my name is Jimmy Potash, and I, I'm the Henry Phipps Professor and the Director of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. It's great to see all of you here today, uh, and, and I'm so delighted to be able to, to welcome our distinguished guests. I want to welcome uh, Ted DeWeese, who's the Interim Dean of the Medical Faculty, CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine. Uh, I'm going to be welcoming uh, the president of the university in a few moments. He'll be here momentarily, Ron Daniels. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome Judy Shi, uh, who made this professorship possible, and our honoree, uh, her husband, Lee McCabe. Uh, Judy and Lee's children um, and their spouses have joined us. Welcome, uh, James, Michael, Joanna, uh, and Sean. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm also pleased to extend a warm welcome to the inaugural recipient uh, of the professorship, Dr. Roland Griffiths and his wife, Marla Wiener. Uh, it's, it's great to have so many faculty members, uh, friends, colleagues, charitable supporters of Dr. Griffiths here to share in this, in this day, special day. Uh, welcome to all of you. So now I'm going to turn things over, uh, turn the program over to, uh, to our interim dean of the medical faculty and CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine, Dr. Ted DeWeese, to present the Oliver Lee McCabe III PhD professorship in the neuropsychopharmacology of consciousness. Ted. Jimmy, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and on behalf of the entire faculty and staff and students of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, I really want to thank everybody for being here today for the dedication of the Oliver Lee McCabe III. How to make third? What is it? The third. McCabe III, a professor in neuropsychopharmacology of consciousness and its most worthy recipient, Dr. Roland Griffiths. Roland, congratulations. Of course, I also uh, want to thank um, Dr. Shee and Dr. McCabe very much uh, for your outstanding generosity and commitment to Johns Hopkins and to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, I think you all know these endowed professorships are very, very important in the life of the entire university for the professor, him or herself, because it helps to support their work and offset some of the salary that's often associated with it so they can be more focused on their work. It's, of course, important to the university uh, itself and helping to support our missions. And, of course, very importantly, to the actual science that the work is going to support. Uh, because without that support, the work can be slowed. So to society more broadly, these professorships are really that important. Um, and as I was mentioning uh, right before we got started, um, to doctors Shee and McCabe, you know, I think professorships in psychiatry in particular are maybe extra important, if you will, because there is yet still, you know, that stigma around diagnoses of mental illness and anything that can drive improved research that ultimately leads to measurable changes and cures, I think will go a long ways to helping people understand the true value of science in, uh, and research in behavioral health leading to cures and that will reduce that stigma ultimately. So I do think this one in particular is that important. So sir, it's doubly grateful on behalf of Johns Hopkins to Drs. Lee uh, and, and uh, to Lee and um, Dr. Shi. I was telling uh, Lee that he, he wouldn't remember, but when I was a resident, Way back, I did hear one of his lectures, uh, seminars that he had given uh, on this. And, you know, he's been involved with Hopkins for a very long time and actual psychedelic research for numbers, numbers of years. We won't yeah. <laughs> I only said numbers. But I did say numbers twice, so I guess that sort of did emphasize that point. Sorry about that. And Dr. Uh, Judy Shi, um, and Judy, you've been truly inspirational with this, but your support more broadly. Um, of Roland and the work that goes on, and again, as I said, to be transformative for the lives of many patients. You know, the science of psychedelics has undergone, um, I think all of us would know, a renaissance 
at least in my notion of that, over the last few years, maybe decade, perhaps, something like that. I'm not sure exactly. And in large part, truly thank you, thanks to Roland and the team that, Roland, you have around you and that you've helped to build. Um, the bold research agenda that you've helped to push forward at the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research, um, I think by any measure has gathered a large amount of attention from many places around the world, uh, and rightfully so. Um, the research and the experience from the center, I think, has clearly demonstrated that uh, you know profound uh, awakenings can occur that have substantial, measurable, sustainable mental health benefits, personal meaning, and sp spiritual significance. Um, each one of those would be worthy of itself, uh, this professorship, but in the totality of it all, and it's really life-changing. Um, it's exciting, burgeoning field, and, and you know, Roland, you've put, put the department and Johns Hopkins really at the fore of this research. You and I were chatting, I was up at Penn recently, and they were uh, just uh, extolling all the virtues of this program and why similarly they feel like I do. So you've certainly done that for us, so thank you for that. Um, so at this time, I would have presented this to, Dr. to Ron Daniels, the president, but you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna delay that just a little bit. Um, when he gets here, we will formally present it because all professorships and endowments are formally presented to the university. So we will do that, and I know uh, President Daniels will have some important words for all of us. I think uh, in lieu of that, I think, Jimmy, it comes back to you, and then we'll keep, continue the program. Roland, again, congratulations. going to create a little drama in the presentation by holding off on presenting the actual <laughs> professorship. Um, so let us move on to um, uh, the introduction uh, of, hang on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, hang on one second. No. Okay, I'm going to tell you um, uh, a little bit about uh, this uh, remarkable couple uh, who make this day possible. Um, well, let me first say that the installment of endowed professorships, they're, they're always occasions for rejoicing, I mean, they're celebrations of magnificent accomplishment, remarkable generosity. They're instances where, where the promise of medicine and the hope for healing and for breakthroughs in how we approach healing stand really in kind of tantalizing focus for us. And today is especially gratifying for me because um, I've gotten to know Judy uh, and Lee over the last uh, four years and developed great affection for and admiration for them both. Lee, uh, Dr. Lee McCabe has played a significant role in our department. Um, he's been in, in the department twice, uh, actually. First, 1979 to 81, he spent two years, sorry about numbers, uh, but he spent two years in our behavioral biology division. Uh, he left and then he came back to the department in 1995. Uh, spent 12 years on our full-time faculty as a psychologist and a mental, mental health services researcher. Uh, with a focus on disaster mental health. He continues now as, as a, as a part-time associate professor. He's accomplished all kinds of impressive things. He's been a president of the American Psychological Association uh, and of the National Academic Behavioral Health Consortium. Uh, his career started with a PhD at Catholic University. Um, his early career focused on time at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. Uh, where he worked with psychologist Bill Richards conducting psychedelic research. And, and during that time, Lee uh, conducted the best study done to date, um, suggesting that psychedelic treatment could be effective in, the, in, in treating opioid use disorder, or narcotic addiction, as they called it at that time. He'd, go on to, he'd continue to conduct studies on narcotic addiction um, uh, he continued to do that after the time in the mid-70s when, when psychedelic research became almost impossible to, to carry out. And then Lee's colleague, Bill Richards, uh, would go on to partner with Roland 
uh, Griffiths in 1999 in restarting the field of psychedelic science. So Lee's professional accomplishments are, are substantial, but they actually don't cover the full range of his passions and achievements. Lee has long been a very, very serious athlete, uh, both in the martial arts uh, and track and field. He's earned Masters All-American Awards in the shot put, the discus throw, and the 35-pound weight throw. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of us could throw something that heavy any distance at all, but I guess he's just throwing it a long distance. Uh, he medaled in the World Senior Olympics. And he holds our state record for the longest discus throw for a man in the 80 to 84-year-old age group. It's online. <laughs> so it must be true. <laughs> uh, um, I'm so grateful to Lee for his many contributions to our department and so uh, admiring of his contributions to the field of psychology, including uh, his work on behavioral treatments of substance use disorders and his pioneering role uh, in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. He is immensely deserving of this remarkable honor, and it's my pleasure to invite Dr. McCabe to the podium. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for that. Thanks for the case illustration on adult ADD. <laughs> <laughs> Career version. <laughs> And I'd do it all over again, I think. Uh, Jimmy, I appreciate uh, those remarks very much. And uh, Dean uh, DeWeese, good to have you here. Appreciate your uh, recognizing the importance of uh, what we're <laughs> trying to do with this, with this uh, very special uh, installation for a very special person. Dr. Roland Griffith. Uh, I, uh, I welcome also the faculty, the friends and the family uh, members here today and uh, look forward to, to talking with you a little bit more intimately at the, uh, the reception. Uh, thank you, Michael DeVita, who, is he here? Did he slip it? There you are. Mike, three years ago, started the, the lead role in coordinating uh, what is coming to fruition here today. Uh, COVID didn't want him to succeed, <laughs> but uh, we did it anyway. You did it, Mike, and uh, good job. Okay. Uh, Roland, I'm, I'm wearing the uh, uncomfortable designation as uh, honoree, uh, but everyone here knows that uh, this, this is your day. But hold that thought, uh, and I'll come back uh, so that I can speak about my, my wife, uh, Judy She, Judy, as, uh, as Jimmy alluded to, is a very, very special person, and we don't have time for me to, to uh, mention all of her uh, wonderful traits, but day to day uh, I live with her. And the one that always stands out to me is her, her quest for knowledge, as evidenced by uh, the volume of reading she does. The, her, her strategy is to read books two and three times, underline, make notes about them, and then convert them to poetry, right, Jimmy? <laughs> uh, She's a very special gal, and uh, 30 years ago when we met, and I mentioned my earlier work with LSD therapy, she, you know, she expressed some enthusiasm about it, but little did I know that uh, three decades later we'd be, we'd be here uh, with her being the primary force uh, behind it. Uh, Judy uh, and I are, are very compatible, and um, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we actually are harmonious in every area except one, and that's sports. <laughs> uh, 
and she uh, she works out every day, but uh, she can't watch a TV football game or basketball game. Or, and do you know why? She can't stand the anguish of the loser. <laughs> now, does that say something about, about Judy? Uh, Judy, I'm, I'm honored uh, that a person like you feels that I should be, be honored. And uh, on behalf of, of everyone who will one day benefit from uh, your generosity, I, I thank you very much. We have about, well, not about, exactly four minutes to talk. And in the next minute, I'm going to try to cover the past, present, and future of psychedelic <laughs> research. Selective coverage. Uh, uh, as was mentioned many years ago, actually um, more than 50, I, did, uh, I was involved with Bill Richards and others in LSD therapy research just 12 miles west of here at Spring Grove State Hospital in the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. I don't have time to describe too much what we did, but the point I want to make is that a very successful program, as measured by the usual criteria of federal funding, including center grants and peer-reviewed publications, it was a model program, and it met its demise. Okay, for a number of reasons, most traceable back to what was happening in society and how that degraded everything uh, we were doing, um, including the ultimate uh, decision by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, their no mass <laughs> decision to just get out of the business and not make LSD available for uh, any researchers. Uh, that's, I think it's an important point uh, because it was external forces that brought the work down. And I think that today the biggest challenge of effective work in the area is external, is societal, specifically the, uh, the proliferation of legislation and uh, economic and commercial activities that aren't necessarily interested in, in duplicating what Dr. Griffiths and his wonderful team has done over the years. So uh, rather than end on, on that note, uh, let me just say that I see this day as marking uh, the beginning of an era of uh, a new era of psychopharmacology research, taking on what some philosophers call the hardest question, the hardest problem, and that's the understanding of consciousness. So uh, may, may Judy's contribution uh, help to that. Okay. Lee, I can only hope, because uh, I had, although I don't practice any of my martial arts, but I did for about 30 years, and have been a runner for longer than that, so I can only hope I'm going to be as engaged in uh, sports at 80 as you are. And Judy, I can only hope uh, I can become more empathetic, like you are, about losers on, uh, against the Ravens or something, because I tend to be less enthusiastic, empathetic than I should be, I'm sure. But with that said, and as I noted in my introductory comments, because endowments for a professorship are held and administered by the university, uh, they're formally presented to the university. So with that in mind, I'm going to invite our president, Ron Daniels, to join me at the podium. Uh, Ron, as dean of the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, I formally present to you, the president of this university, the Oliver Lee McCabe III Professorship in the neuropsychopharmacology of consciousness. Ron? Congratulations, Ron. 
So uh, thank you very much, Ted. And I do apologize for being a few minutes late. It turns out that the uh, president's entourage created some complexities here in traffic, so it took a little more time than usual to get here. Um, I'm going to dispense with uh, my formal remarks because just given the, uh, the speeches you've heard to date, I suspect some of what I was going to say has, been, uh, has already been discussed. But, but let me just say the following. First and foremost, I, I feel really great about being the president of a university that is able to accept a professorship in the neuropsychopharmacology of consciousness. And I can't imagine that there are many other university presidents <laughs> who have that distinct honor uh, and privilege. And so, uh, so first and foremost, thank you for that. And Judy, thank you for your generosity and vision in making this happen. But I, I do want to say something that also I think is really important and Lee picks up on what you said a few moments ago. Um, you know, when you look at, as I do, the university, and you see um, the activity that daily goes on within the institution, and in particular, you look at this vast, complex, and very rich research enterprise that we house here at Johns Hopkins, and you see um, the work that our scholars are doing sometimes, and teams sometimes solitary, but that is being uh, supported uh, by the university and, of course, by a host of different stakeholders, most importantly by the federal government. But you realize, and we talk a lot about the importance of supporting that enterprise, and we often articulate the ideas of academic freedom and the sense of what the idea of the university is and how important it is that the university, having made judgments about the people whom we want to entrust about being faculty members of the university, but ultimately when they get here, the restrictions, constraints on their dreams, on the things that they think are important, on the research they pursue, no matter how difficult it is, ultimately is their call. And indeed, it is the purpose of the university to support that work no matter where it takes them. Now we say that, and we say a lot, you know, in the last couple of years, as we've had the cultural wars going on, we talk a lot about the importance of academic freedom and why that's a core value to the university. But it seems to me what we mark here today um, is the powerful case study for why these words, academic freedom and the spirit of curiosity driven research, these words that we must so often are so important or so fundamental to the institution. Because you know, when I look at, we, Roland, what you have done, the number of times that you have followed ideas, that you have pursued projects that um, strain conventional wisdom, were seen to be orthogonal, indeed deeply offensive to a number of different parts of our world, um, that called for censor, limitation, restriction, uh, by the university and by other grant agencies and so forth. And despite that, you were able to continue to do the work that matters, that followed the ideas uh, where they took you and to be able to pursue this research that ultimately the ideas that people chuckled about, were dismissive of, maybe were horrified by, that really strain conventional wisdom, now become the conventional wisdom. To my mind, that's the purchase of the university. That's what makes us special. That's what makes us an institution apart from so many other institutions in society where we entrust the individual or the small group of people to have the courage to follow their ideas, their convictions, no matter where it takes them, no matter who we offend. And so for me today, in celebrating you, we celebrate the best of what we can do at the university. Not the easy stuff where we do the projects, where we know the answers, we're just looking for a little more empirical validation. Uh, not the work where we just sort of deepen the grooves that are already been cut, but where you go and cut new grooves and go in directions that people are, are really resistant to and often offended by. Um, you're the best of the university. And you give courage, fortitude, inspiration to so many of us. Because when we tell this story 
of why we're a place apart and why we have to trust these individual germs of ideas that go in places that are unsettling, you need, you need examples. You need validation. You're our validation. We're so proud of the work you've done. We're so proud of your courage. We're so proud of where you've taken us and what it's going to mean to so many different uh, individuals in our society um, who suffer in so many deep and profound ways and who will benefit, have benefited, and will continue to benefit from the work that you've unleashed. Wow. We really celebrate you. Thank you for being uh, a part of this great institution, and thank you for the courage uh, to uh, show us, as I said before, the best of the university. It's a real honor to accept this professorship. Wow, that was beautiful. That was so beautiful. It's a tough act to follow. I just want to pause a moment and just let that sink in. That was wonderful. Thank you, Rod. Bring the Afghar story. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, so that was really wonderful. I love that. Uh, let me turn. Uh, we were talking. We were. We were. We were celebrating Lee, and I want to turn to the other half of uh, the dynamic duo of Lee and Judy. Um, I want to talk about Judy, the donor of this endowed professorship. Judy is really a fascinating woman of many talents, as Lee suggested. Uh, she grew up in a Taiwanese family that had moved to the U.S. She studied psychology at Iowa State. Um, a state that I'm very fond of. Uh, got a master's in psychology at Marquette, worked as a therapist in our department, in our children's mental health center, and in other places. She went on to earn a PhD, uh, focused on health policy at UMBC. Uh, spent several years working in that arena uh, on issues like substance use disorders and HIV. Um, uh, accomplished an enormous amount uh, while she was formally working and has accomplished an enormous amount since she stopped working. Uh, in retirement, uh, Judy's been really kind of remarkably active, uh, deploying her prodigious energy in areas like academics, philanthropy, and the arts. And this has included uh, serving as co-chair of our department's advisory board. We're very grateful for that. Uh, she's been wonderful in that role. Um, the thing that actually most struck me in getting to know Judy is that she took up painting during COVID and in short order, a kind of remarkably short time, produced a number of really gorgeous and interesting paintings. Um, she's also been writing poems, as Lee alluded to, including verses like this. Um, My life is like a tree made of earth, air, and water. My branches reach for sky, filled with hope and wonder. One day the tree will die, its age marked in rings, its trunk once old and gnarly. Now a table, its beauty sings. I could go on, but, but I'll, I'll stop here and, and tell you that uh, I'm incredibly grateful to Judy for the immensity of her generosity. Um, I do very much hope that like the table from the poem, uh, whose beauty will continue in perpetuity to sing, that the good work that comes from the support of this professorship will hit many sonorous notes and contribute to healing for generations to come. Uh, th so thanks so much, Judy, for the huge vote of confidence in Hopkins and for this wonderful contribution to our mission. Um, and now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Judy Shee to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Potash, for your kind introduction. I would also like to thank um, President Daniels, Dean DeWeese, faculty, staff, family, and friends for being here today at this installation um, to honor Dr. L Oliver Lee McKay and Dr. Roland Griffith. Um, this professorship was actually launched in February 2020. And um, it took three years before we were able to have this ceremony. And I want to thank Mike DeVito, 
and his uh, colleagues for their tireless effort to arrange for this uh, celebration. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and Lee, I am pleased to be able to endow this professorship in your name um, to show my deep gratitude and appreciation uh, for you, my husband, whom I love and respect. And in your relationship with your family and friends, your kind and gentle nature, your love and loyalty are always present. And in your work and in your working relationships, you have imprinted your integrity, uh, your excellence, and your soundness of judgment. And thank you so much for just being who you are and, and uh, being in our lives. Um, many of you who have worked with Dr. McCabe at Hopkins may not be familiar with his work in uh, psychedelic research. Uh, at Spring Grove Hospital and at the Maryland Psychiatric Center, Lee was centrally involved in, um, in clinical research with LSD therapy with inpatients with severe affective and anxiety disorders, and also those with uh, alcohol and opioid dependencies. Uh, as the director of the um, addiction research, he conducted the first randomized study, and I believe the last uh, such study, with a group of long-term heroin users. And an independent one-year follow-up study um, showed a significant and substantial rates of abstinence in this experimental group. Uh, with this research team, Lee also conducted pioneering studies in Narcan, which is a life-saving drug that is um, now uh, included in the CDC, in the uh, World Health Organization's list of essential medications. And more recently, CDC adopted uh, a framework that was developed by Lee to identify areas of improvement related to the quality of the organizational and staff uh, response during a, um, a public health emergency. And the reason I'm highlighting a few of Lee's extensive research work is to show the connection between uh, the work that Lee does and Dr. Griffith. And Dr. Griffith, I'm just, it's a great honor for me to let you know that I am um, deeply grateful for the work that you have done, which has helped so many and has the potential to help so many more. And I also want to acknowledge your courage and determination to pursue the area of study in psychedelics, which received so little external funding and support for so many years. Um, but most importantly, however, it is it is the rigor and, um, and discipline that you bring forth to your work that I think will be a gift to us all. Um, Dr. Griffiths is now the leading voice in evidence-based uh, clinical use of psychedelics uh, for the treatment of patients. And his research also in psychedelics also extends to advancing our understanding of consciousness and um, exploring other alternative uh, uh, potentials for this, for psychedelics. And I thank you both, Dr. McCabe and Dr. Griffith. I thank you now and I thank you forward for all the people that have benefited and will continue to benefit because of your research. And it is with the belief that um, research at Hopkins uh, is, um, is held to the highest standards of excellence that I have endowed this professorship, the Dr. Oliver Lee McCabe the third uh, professorship in the Neuropsychopharmacology of Consciousness. And I believe it is the first of such professorships for the study of consciousness. Um, and like so many things, there is a synchronicity in uh, this effort to forward research in this area that has been followed by others. And I think it's wonderful to be able to join hands on this journey because together we can do greater things. I think 
let us celebrate today because we're so fortunate to have these two giants with us, uh, Dr. McCabe and Dr. Griffith, and with regard to their far-reaching impact of their research, as well as their, the strength of their character. And I want to thank you both so very much. Thank you. That was wonderful, Judy. Thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, We're going to turn now uh, to our. In, no, oh, do you want to get in and do something on the screen? Um, turn now to our inaugural recipient, Dr. Griffiths. Um, so W. P. Kinsella is may not be a familiar name to you. He was a Canadian novelist uh, who infused his work with magical realism. Uh, he's best known as the author of the short story, Shoeless Joe, which inspired the beloved movie Field of Dreams. The story is set in Iowa's cornfields and revolves around a farmer who's inspired to build a baseball diamond in a cleared out patch of corn. The idea that doing so will revive a legendary player and also reconcile him with his deceased father. The inspiration comes through the farmer hearing a voice saying, if you build it, he will come. And that line, in some people's minds, like mine, modified to, if you build it, they will come, uh, in, the, in, in the popular imagination, it, it's become one of the most memorable lines in movie history. Well, you know, we've been, we've been building a magnificent department here for 110 years, uh, but there's been no more important builder for us in the 21st century than Roland Griffiths. Uh, beginning in 1999, um, Roland built, was built an incredibly impressive program around research on the psychedelic drug psilocybin. As most of you know, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. His 2006 uh, paper on mystical type experiences with the drug launched the rebirth of the psychedelic research field. Not just according to me, uh, but according to Michael Pollan, uh, who wrote a best-selling book, uh, How to Change Your Mind. Uh, in that book, he, um, he called that paper the launching point for the new science of psychedelics. A decade later, Roland's 2016 paper on the use of the drug to, to treat depression and anxiety in the setting of uh, inpatients with cancer played a key role in advancing large-scale studies uh, of psilocybin to treat depression. And then two years ago, Roland and his colleagues published a very high-profile paper uh, on the first rigorous controlled study of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy uh, in the treatment of major depressive disorder, or clinical depression. The result of all this, uh, this painstaking, careful building, uh, has been that they indeed have come. Uh, donors have come. In 2019, they provided the resources to create the center for psychedelic and consciousness research. And then more donors came initially with the gift we're celebrating today to create endowed funds to keep the center's work moving forward for the long haul. Uh, trainees have come in large numbers uh, so that the center now has more than 40 members. And these have included some very talented people like Matt Johnson who became president of the International Society for Psychedelic Research, Fred Barrett, now the center's associate director uh, and a leader in the study of mechanisms underlying psychedelic action. Uh, and patients seeking to be a part of the studies have come in large numbers, eager to have access to what could be a life-altering treatment. And the press has come with countless journalists, writers, filmmakers, podcasters, eager to tell the fascinating story of Roland and his magical mind-altering mushroom-based treatment. Uh, recently, for example, Roland appeared in a Netflix miniseries based on the How to Change Your Mind book. A video podcast he's done has a, over a million views on YouTube. So I've worked closely with Roland since taking over as department director in 2017, and I was eager to facilitate the creation of the center in 2019. I've been enthusiastic about helping to plan for its continued success. And along the way, I've gotten to know Roland and to get a sense as to how he was able to build something so special. 
I've seen how remarkably determined he is, how very, very hard he works, how methodical and systematic his thinking is, and how deeply he considers things. It's in part because Roland's standards are so high that he's been the perfect person to lead the world into the new era of psychedelic science. He's someone whose work and whose results people consider unimpeachable. On a personal level, it's been a great pleasure in the past year to spend time with Roland uh, at the American Psychiatric Association meeting uh, where we passed a couple of hours walking the streets of New Orleans, uh, New Orleans French Quarter in particular, having dinner with his mentee, David Yaden, and, and, and David's wife, Bit Yaden, who's a native of New Orleans. Uh, and it was delightful to, to, uh, to dine with uh, Roland and his, and his wife, Marla, at their home as we explored issues of family and spirituality. Uh, so I am absolutely delighted that Judy chose to honor Roland with, with this uh, wonderful professorship. And uh, gosh, it's, it's such an honor and a thrill for me to be able to confer my departmental blessing uh, on this wonderful moment in Roland's career. Uh, as you've heard, an endowed professorship confers all kinds of advantages. It frees up people's faculty members' time to allow them to focus on things of lasting value, even if they're not immediately remunerative. It signals to the world that the holder is extraordinarily accomplished, held in the highest esteem by the institution. Roland, it couldn't have happened to a more deserving person. Thanks for all you've done over the years for our department and for Johns Hopkins and for the fields of neuropsychopharmacology, psychedelic science and therapeutics and consciousness research. So now I'm pleased to have uh, uh, Dr. Griffiths and Dr. DeWeese join me at the podium for the presentation of the professorship medallion. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, I think we've heard, at least from my take, really only a fraction, Roland, of, I think, the impact that you've had, but more importantly, what your work and that of your colleagues will have. I mean, you're changing lives. Uh, families are going to be stitched back together because of it, where they haven't been before. And so I think the future looks pretty doggone bright. So thank you for that. And Dr. Shee, thank you for the support that this means today, but the other uh, professors that will follow uh, Roland in this. Uh, Roland, so recognized as the highest honor of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine that we can bestow upon a member of our faculty, endowed professorships are vital, as we've all said, to the ongoing mission that we have of teaching and of research and of patient care. Endowments allow for us to hire and retain the very best in this School of Medicine, and it's sort of the foundation upon which everything is built is our faculty. Roland, the professors who hold these endowed professors conduct some of the most significant and important research. Um, of course, they attract the best and brightest residents and students and other trainees and bring considerable prestige to the Johns Hopkins name. So on behalf of all of us in the School of Medicine, I am pleased to present to you this medallion as a symbol of this honor and in celebration of your installation as the inaugural recipient of the Oliver Lee McCabe III Professorship in Neuropsychopharmacology of Consciousness in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Roland, congratulations. Uh, recent life circumstances has made me, has made cultivation of uh, gratitude a principal practice in my life, and this occasion affords no shortage of opportunities for expressing gratitude. So thank you, President Daniels, uh, Dean DeWeese, uh, Jimmy, for your uh, kind comments, and Jimmy, for your incredible support of the psychedelic work. Uh, over the course of these many years. And um, 
And of course, I want to thank uh, uh, Judy Shi for uh, this incredible generosity of uh, endowing this uh, professorship. It means so much. And it's doubly, triply meaning to me because uh, Lee McCabe, I consider uh, a friend and uh, a colleague. And as, as we've heard, he, uh, he foreshadowed what we have resurrected here. Uh, and you mentioned the dates now. It's uh, five decades ago. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Um, and then, of course, uh, I finally want to uh, thank my incredible colleagues in the, uh, in the Center on Psychedelic and Conscious Research. And just by name, Fred Parrott, Albert Garcia Romeo, David Yaden, Natalie Glukasen, and Sandeep, uh, all very talented. So I uh, joined the Hopkins faculty in 1972. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's half a century ago. Uh, and it was immediately after completing my doctoral training at University of Minnesota in this newly emerging field that combined experimental analysis of behavior with pharmacology and, and thus giving way to the name behavioral pharmacology. And it was at the University of Minnesota uh, that I first started working with George Bigelow, who's uh, here and who preceded me to Hopkins uh, by a year. And then Maxine Stitzer, also a in the back of the room, joined us a few years later. And the three of us founded the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Center in 1975, which has become a world-renowned human psychopharmacology research center. Uh, and uh, it continues today under the very able leadership of uh, Eric Strain. So in addition to my uh, friendship and respect for George, who was very instrumental in getting me to consider the appointment at Hopkins, so too was uh, Joseph Brady. Uh, and uh, he was founder and director of the Division of Behavioral Biology at the time. Now, Joe was known for his many aphorisms. And, uh, and what he said uh, to me and others, he would glowingly describe Hopkins as uh, the mecca of rugged individualism. And he's talking about science, and it, it reflects some of the comments that uh, preceded this. Uh, uh, and that sounded good. And, and, and what that meant to me was we were free to pursue any line of rigorous research that interested us as long as we could pay for it, <laughs> as long as we could get funded. Uh, and that sense of scientific freedom uh, was true then, and it's remained true throughout my career, and I'm very grateful for that. For me, the engagement with uh, science, the fun of, of science, has always been to follow my curiosity. It's, it's about discovering how things work, and that's what science is about at its heart. Early in my career, uh, a good friend and scientific colleague spoke about laboratory as carnival. And I, I love the image uh, and, the, and the sentiment uh, behind that. Uh, it's an opportunity for those of us trained in science to have fun, to play, to celebrate discovery. And so with my training in drugs and behavior, uh, studying behavior and subjective effects of drugs became my playground. And, uh, and, personal, and personal curiosity was driving the show. So I started by exploring and then demonstrating extensive similarities uh, between models of drug abuse, both in animals and, and humans. And what we did is cross-validating methodologies now widely used to assess the abuse liability of different drugs. While that line of research uh, continued, curiosity led me 
in a different direction to initiate studies on the behavioral pharmacological determinants of cigarette smoking, uh, despite the fact that nicotine addiction was not widely recognized at that point, and it was not a NIH funding priority. My interest in that line of research then faded as I became curious about uh, my own habitual coffee drinking <laughs> as, a, as another model system for looking at how pharmacology, how drugs can capture and control behavior. And despite some derision that the topic was simply too trivial uh, to, to study, and it was certainly not going to be a funding priority for NIH. I pursued this line of research for many years, demonstrating that caffeine, uh, in fact, has, is behaviorally active at doses far lower than those previously recognized, and that uh, both caffeine withdrawal and caffeine addiction represent psychiatric conditions worthy of official recognition. And then once again, curiosity captured my interest. Uh, this is 25 years ago, and I started a meditation practice and had some completely novel and, and what I felt to be profound uh, experiences, which prompted me to start reading pretty extensively about meditation and religious experiences that had some qualities that seemed to overlap with what I was uh, experiencing. And, uh, and in the course of that reading, of course, I eventually stumbled onto this decades-old literature, which was really quite extensive but largely forgotten on uh, psychedelic drugs. Um, and, and with the thought that those psychedelic drugs might occasion some of the same kinds of uh, experiences. Well, if initiating uh, research with nicotine and caffeine seemed problematic, <laughs> the idea of psychedelic research was much, much more so. So the extensive, incautious use of psychedelic drugs during the 1960s resulted in widespread media coverage uh, of what was uh, proposed at the time to represent catastrophic risk of even exposure to psychedelics. And that, in turn, resulted in severe legal and regulatory restrictions, as well as withdrawing, drawing of all federal funding for human research. And then, furthermore, within the academy, within academia, uh, the a mere expression of interest in psychedelics uh, for uh, in studying those in humans was largely met with suspicion and considered by some to be a third rail for career success. Uh, but at that time, I was already a full professor <laughs> in, the, in the departments of psychiatry and, and neuroscience, and I had an international reputation for conducting rigorous research. So I proceeded to design a study which sought to administer a high dose of psilocybin uh, to uh, healthy volunteers who were completely psychedelic naive. Now, although the study was designed to be both scientifically rigorous and safe, achieving the institutional and federal approval of this kind of study uh, was by no means a, a certainty. And in fact, no such study had been approved in the United States for decades. Now here, I want to acknowledge uh, the role of Johns Hopkins and, 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 and the integrity of it as an institution here. The Johns Hopkins IRB is a committee that's charged with looking at risk-benefit ratios and, uh, and ultimately deciding whether new research can go forward. Well, after considerable internal deliberations and in consult with the dean of the medical school at the time and a consulting attorney, the Hopkins IRB approved the study despite obvious public relation risks that unfavorable media coverage could have unleashed. And I'm, I, I'm certain that at that 
time the study would have been rejected by the great majority of academic institutions. Um, and, and therefore, I just I want to underscore uh, my pride in Johns Hopkins as an institution for its integrity and for its thoughtful approval of research in spite of potential negative political consequences. As they say, the rest is history. Uh, we published our first study in 2006. As Jimmy mentioned, it's, uh, it's sometimes credited with starting the psychedelic uh, renaissance. We have now conducted numerous psychedelic studies uh, and have repeatedly demonstrated that a single session with psilocybin can produce rapid and enduring positive changes in attitudes, moods, and behavior in both healthy volunteers and in patients. Our therapeutic studies suggest psilocybin may have efficacy in treating major depressive disorders, cigarette smoking addiction, anorexia nervosa, and anxiety and depression in cancer patients. As Jimmy mentioned, uh, three years ago, we received a $17 million award or gift from philanthropic support to establish the Center of, uh, for Psychedelic and Conscious Research at Johns Hopkins. And it's the first uh, center in the United States, the largest and most productive in the world, currently with seven faculty members, six affiliated investigators, five postdocs. So in recent years, this field of psychedelic research has literally mushroomed, pardon, <laughs> pardon the pun, uh, with the founding of, and this is, sounds unbelievable, literally hundreds, I think it's 250, for-profit startup companies. And now there's at least a dozen major academic institutions that have established their own psychedelic research centers, and notably following in the footsteps of, of Johns Hopkins. Further, several companies are now conducting FDA-compliant uh, investigations uh, that could ultimately result in the approval of psilocybin for medical treatment in as few as a, as a few or several years. But the story doesn't doesn't end there, it, it continues. Curiosity about psychedelic mechanisms of action, their medical applications, and the pro-social effects that these compounds can engender uh, has, uh, has, has made, uh, ha has enhanced curiosity both for myself and for my very competent colleagues at the at the center. Um, it's, it's really a super exciting scientific area right now, and I have every confidence that my colleagues and their successors will carry this research forward for many decades to come. Now, for me, it's been, as you might imagine, enormously gratifying and humbling to be identified as having played a, a key role in this explosion of interest in psychedelic research. Uh, and further on this occasion, to be honored by being the first recipient of the Lee McCabe uh, professorship. But a good fortune also really pervades my experience and understanding of these events. Put simply, I feel very fortunate to have just been a curious scientist with the right training at the right time, with the right colleagues, in the right institution that Joe Brady so aptly characterized as the mecca of rugged individualism. Mm, wow. 
such a fascinating story. It's so beautifully told, Roland. Uh, I'm having such a good time that I hate the fact that we have to end this. We're not really ending, we're just moving next door to continue the conversation. Um, but thanks to the family and friends and colleagues of Judy and Lee and Roland for joining us today. Um, I also wanna join in the previous thanks to Mike DeVito, who I don't see here, but thanks Mike for, for doing such great work and putting this all, there he is, putting this all together. And yes, thank you, Mike. Um, the, uh, it is a pleasure to invite you to continue the conversation just outside these doors uh, in the lovely atrium. Again, great to have all of you here. Thank you.